So since uh, September, we've had two broad themes that we've been looking at on a Sunday morning and being really attentive people. You'll be well aware of that, won't you? Yeah, you're well aware of the two themes of the mission of God and Jesus in Isaiah. And this morning is Advent Sunday, and I think those three themes all come together, I think. But that wasn't because I planned it carefully like that. It just happens that way. We've travelled... Uh, through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we've seen the ways in which God's mission has unfolded, but we haven't yet looked at the greatest example of all of the mission of God, which is God himself on mission, the way God himself goes about doing mission, which is Jesus. And so this morning's a good time to look at that, the first Sunday of Advent. And last week, with Lance, as we were looking at Jesus in Isaiah, we were thinking about the way in which Isaiah looked forward hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born and saw that the Messiah would be both God and man. And again, that comes together in our reading this morning. From John chapter 1, we've read part of this already, but we're going to read it again. John chapter 1 and the first uh, 18 verses. We'll be reading this passage again in the new year because... uh, Once we uh, start on the new year at the high school and whatever, we're going to be looking at John's gospel, certain aspects of it. And of course, this passage is like the overture to John's gospel. It's like the introduction and a number of the key themes that appear later in the gospel, he begins to unpack here. But this morning, we're looking at it specifically in terms of the gift of Jesus. And John uses this word, the word to describe Jesus. And so he writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man and woman was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this, your word, and we pray this morning, Lord, that this, your word, will become alive among us. We pray this morning again, Lord, that you would release your life-giving word to bring your life in our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. So how does God go about mission? Well, as we looked in the Old Testament, as we looked in the New Testament, there is a direction of movement, and that is the overall direction is either going or being sent, depending on which way you're looking at it. And so right from the beginning, Abraham, God said to Abraham, go. In the New Testament, he says to the church, go. And Jesus, the Father said to Jesus, go. And Jesus is the sent one, sent from the glory of heaven, to live as a human being, right at the heart of the mission of God, that is the movement, go, being sent. As the Father has sent me, 
so I am sending you. But Jesus being sent has a particular feature to it, doesn't it? That we remember this morning. The, that we read in those first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. This incomprehensible to us aspect of Jesus being sent, he's becoming a human being. The creator enters his creation as a creature. got that? Do you understand that? Because if you do, you haven't got it. (laughs) And that's the amazing thing. It's what we call the incarnation. Incarnation simply means embodied in flesh or taking on flesh. And the key verse for us is verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Four words that blow our minds, that the eternal son of God should become a human being. But we see in these verses in John's Gospel the amazing consequences of Jesus going on that journey, of Jesus being sent. Because what we see is revelation. That through Jesus there is a revelation of the nature of God. And that revelation came through experience. And there's a wonderful kind of contrast or paradox in these verses, the word became what? The word became more words? No, the word became flesh. And often, to us, the word actually does become more words. But the word becomes flesh, and it's through the flesh, it's through Jesus becoming a human being, that the revelation happens. And it's as the disciples rub shoulders with the human Jesus that the reality that he is the Son of God is revealed. And it's through their experience of this human being that they come face to face with God himself. That's what they said. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. In the Old Testament... Glory is about a physical manifestation of the presence of God. It's not some kind of spooky thing. It's the reality of an experience of God. And they say of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, when we encountered him, in him we met the glory of God, the manifestation of the presence of God. And they say he was full of grace and truth full of grace and truth. I think it was Chief, uh, suffering that problem. I can't get the words out. I think it was Steve Chalk, not Chief Stalk. I think it was Steve Chalk who said, the trouble with Christians sometimes is that we've been full of truth and there's not always been a lot of grace. But Jesus, it's John says, he was full of grace and truth. And Steve Chalk points out maybe the order is important full of grace and truth. Not only was he full of these things, says John, but actually, because he was full of them, we received them. We received them. From the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. And as he says in verse 18, ultimately, as we encountered Jesus, then we encountered God himself. And again, that's a theme that obviously runs throughout this gospel. And right towards the end, just before Jesus dies, uh, one of the disciples says to him, uh, Jesus, show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, doesn't he, to them, he says, haven't I been with you long enough? Don't you know who I am? I and the Father are one. And uh, he was a farmer, a former, a farmer, a former, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, who said this, commenting on verses like this, he said, God is Christ-like, and in him there is no unchristlikeness at all. In other words, in Jesus, you get the full revelation of God. Paul writes to the Colossians that in him, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. 
God is Christ-like, and in him there is no unchristlike, a Christ-likeness at all. There could only ever be one incarnation, because there only ever is one Son of God, the one and only. And yet, in us, God is continuing the process. Not incarnation with a capital I, but incarnation with a small I. And as we learn to be followers of Jesus, as we learn to be his disciples, as we learn to be his imitators, then this aspect of the life of Jesus should be present in us. Even in you and me, the word becomes flesh. Because the Spirit of God lives in us, doesn't he? And the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Jesus. And with a small eye, then that ministry of Jesus is continued in you and me. It, it's right at the heart of God's call on our lives, Romans 8. We're familiar with that first bit. We hang on to that, but we don't always follow the verse through. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Full stop, end of story. No, it isn't because it goes on, who have been called according to his purpose, not our purpose. And what's his purpose? He goes on, his purpose is that we should be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Can you see the wisdom of God's eternal plan? God's eternal plan is that throughout the earth, there should be millions of little Jesuses. That's you and I that the ministry and the life of Jesus should be multiplied through us. That's his calling on our lives. It's impossible, but it's his calling on our lives. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. How was the character of God revealed? Yes, some of it was revealed by what Jesus said, but most of it was revealed just by who he was. And as the disciples rubbed shoulders with Jesus. They encountered God himself. Actually, if you think about it, there's nothing new in incarnation. It's been a consistent way that God works throughout both Testaments. Because when we looked at God's mission in the Old Testament, what God was longing to do through the people of Israel was, he was longing that they should be an embodiment of his character in the midst of the nations. Do you remember that? That was God's desire. Actually, it was incarnation. He wanted them to incarnate his character so that the nations, as they looked on, should see that. And that's why they came under judgment, because they did not display his character. In Jesus, you see that in its fulfillment. But then in the New Testament, us, we, the people of God, that same process is to continue. That in us... Not just as individuals, but together, in us, his character should be displayed for all to see. So incarnation, actually, you see it in its fullness in John here, but it's been around throughout the Old Testament, and it continues in the New Testament as well. Daryl Gouda uh, puts it like this. He says, the gospel cannot be captured adequately in propositions, creeds, or theological systems as crucial as these exercises are. He's not discounting that. But then he goes on to say, the gospel dwells in and shapes the people who are called to be its witness. The message is inextricably linked with its messengers. Our lives are the message. The word becomes flesh in and through us as well. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Can you see how it's essential to have both of those sides of the phrase? The word became flesh and lived on a desert island would be a bit pointless, wouldn't it? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And the way in which Jesus fulfilled the mission of God was by his presence in the world. We're going to uh, rehearse the well-known Bible stories about the birth of Jesus in a few weeks, aren't we? We're going to listen again to the angel coming to Mary 
We're going to listen again to the angels appearing to the shepherds. We're going to listen, etc., etc. We know the story as well. We know a story about Jesus when he was 12 years old, don't we? Remember that one? In the temple. What else do you know about Jesus' childhood? What else do you know about Jesus' years working as a carpenter? Absolutely diddly squit. Nothing. For 30 years, almost complete silence. What was that all about? Well, Jesus was just living as part of a community. During all those years, part of the very fabric of a local community. Who knew him? Think of those boys who grew up in the synagogue school with him. They didn't know they were rubbing shoulders with the Son of God, did they? Actually, some early Christians couldn't cope with that. So they made up gospels about how Jesus made little figures out of clay and they turned into live animals. Nonsense. Because Jesus was just living as part of a community. In fact, it wasn't just any community, was it? It was an obscure community. And um, it's a bit like Norfolk, really. And the, and the posh southerners down south in Jerusalem, they despised Galilee. A bit like restaurant critics in London and their attitude towards Norfolk. In fact, it, later on in John chapter 1, somebody says to somebody, hey, you must come and meet this Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, what, Nazareth? Is, anybody, any, is there anything of any worth ever come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? It's an obscure place. And yet, in this obscure place, Jesus, the Son of God, he was submerged in that culture. And the Son of God lived, and the life of God was actually expressed in and through that local culture. Isn't that extraordinary? That God should submit himself. Now, you might say, well, that's a bit speculative. Well, no. have you ever read the parables? I mean, sometimes when we read the parables, we have to think about them, or we have to understand the society in which, into which they were spoken in order to understand what the parable is about. Because Jesus is embedded in a local culture and it's out of that local culture that he expresses the fact that he is the Son of God. In contrast to that, sometimes we get the idea that if God calls us, he's going to take us out of our culture. He's going to take us out of our situation, out of our job, out of our neighborhood, out of our humdrum existence. Jesus knows all about humdrum existences. He lived that way as a local carpenter for many, many years. Somehow we think that the call of God will bring us out into something more spiritual. And yet the Son of God lived all those years hidden When uh, Eugene Peterson translates this passage in the message, then he translates it like this, doesn't he? God moved into the neighborhood. Some people don't like the English that lies behind that, but actually the theological truth is absolutely right, isn't it? God moved into the neighborhood. Just think for a moment. Your humdrum life. God has put you there on purpose. Because in you lives the spirit of Jesus. And when you live your life in that neighborhood, then God has moved into your neighborhood, in you. I wonder what communities you're part of. For some of us, we're, we have a sense of being part of a geographical community. You know, we've lived in the same place for many, many years we know the people around, and we are known in that community, and we are part of a geographical community. For some of us, it's more of a kind of network spread out community that we're part of. Uh, maybe it's at work, where people come from all over the place uh, to work. Maybe it's a hobby or a club that you're part of, that you're in relationship uh, through people, a community like that. Many of us meet people in what are called third places. You know, the first place is our home, the second place is our work, and the third place is, well, it might be the gym, probably not looking around. <laughs> Smack me afterwards, just checking you're still awake. 
It might be the pub. It might be wherever it is, wherever the third place that you meet people. You see, when we begin to think about mission like this, it's not something we put in our diary. It's the way we live our lives. Because we are embodying the presence of God in the communities that God has put us in. So it's not an added extra, but it is a way of thinking. And we begin to think some things like, as I think about the communities I'm part of, I begin to ask myself this question, am I ever present to the people there? Oh, I'm there, but am I present to them? Or am I just using these people in my community to actually meet my needs? Is there any real interaction going on? These are the questions a missionary might ask. I I know there's several of them up there. Don't, Don't get confused by that, but... Where are people gathering and experiencing community? You might say to me, well, hang about, you've talked about communities, but, but within the community that you're part of, there will be, and if they're not, then maybe you're the person to create them, there will be places where people gather, where people meet, where there's interaction between people. Where is that happening in your geographic or your networked community? Usually at work, it's around the coffee machine, isn't it? What are the current life issues that people are facing? You know, we live through periods of massive change, but one of the big changes, have you noticed that complete strangers will tell you their life story? Have you noticed that? 30 years ago, they wouldn't have done, would they? There's a change gone on. I, I've got a theory about why it is, but I won't bore you with that one. But complete strangers will tell you their life, will tell you the intimate parts of their lives, whether you want to know it or not. What life issues are people facing? Where are people expressing a longing for the divine? Oh, you've got all new age on us now, you say? The divine? I I put that on there deliberately because people will not express their longing after God in our language because they haven't got our vocabulary, that's all. So when somebody talks about to you about, oh, I went to the spiritualists or I went to the seance, don't rush to put them right Listen to their story. They're expressing a longing after something beyond the physical. You don't need to correct them. Listen to their story. Understand, why are they looking there? What are they looking for? Ask open-ended questions. Hear their story. And don't just hear their story so that you can give them your testimony. Hear their story because you want to hear their story. Okay, this is a lesson to me. And then when you've heard their story, maybe you've won the right to tell them your story. And you don't have to put them right because your story puts them right. Because you've encountered Jesus. And what what is Jesus? Jesus is full of grace and truth. From his fullness of his grace, you have received one blessing after another. You see, your experience of Jesus knocks their experience of the spiritualist church into a cocked hat. You don't need to put them right. Your story puts them right, I think. You can smack me afterwards or stone me or whatever. What's good news to these people? See, the Apostle Paul, these are the questions the Apostle Paul asked when he went into a new place. And he didn't present the gospel in the same way everywhere, did he? He didn't have an ABC of the gospel, actually. He knew the gospel well enough in its multifaceted truth to actually help people discover Jesus where they were. Oops, sorry. Just how frequently do you meet with people? Regularity. Because Jesus rubbed shoulders with these people. They saw him. This is not hit and run. This is about building relationships with people over time. And in that, do you have time for spontaneity? You know, if you're part of a community and an opportunity arises to deepen the relationship, have you got the wherewithal to go with that? Are you prepared to ring the cell group up and say, I'm not coming tonight because actually I've got an opportunity to have a meal with so-and-so, da 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 Because Jesus did that. 
Jesus killed somebody because of that. He was on the way to Jairus' daughter, wasn't he? I mean, it's all right for Jesus because he can raise the dead. But he was on the way to Jairus' daughter, and Jesus had enough spontaneity that as somebody draws alongside him and touches him and he feels power go out, he stops what he's doing, and he... Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem. It says he set his face to Jerusalem, and then he sees a man in a tree. So he goes to Zacchaeus. You know, Jesus, even in the midst of all that, is he responds to opportunities as they arise. Hospitality and community are massive things in our favor. The interesting thing about Jesus and his hospitality is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the only meal he ever kind of hosted was the Last Supper, wasn't it? The rest of the time he spent eating and drinking in other people's houses. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> interesting, isn't it? See, we kind of think we've got to have all the answers and get people to ours, but Jesus spent his life on other people's turf, eating and drinking their food and wine. Community is very important that, um, you know, and again, fishers of men, they went fishing in teams. Daryl Gouda, again, part of that quote, the centrality, the centrality of the community to the gospel means that the message is never disembodied. The word must always become flesh, embodied in the life of the community. And again, we are looking for people of peace. We're looking for those in whom God is already at work where there is a response to the kingdom. And those people of peace, they're not just responsive, but actually they open up their networks to us. And we enable the kingdom of God to run through their friends. All of this summed up in Michael Frost, the Australian missiologist, who says, we cannot demonstrate Christ-likeness at a distance. We need to get close enough to people that our lives rub up against their lives and they see the incarnated Christ in our values, beliefs, and practices expressed in cultural forms that make sense and convey impact. Jesus was a man of his time. He spoke the language of the people and he communicated by being a man of his time. So, let's sum it up and then we'll use a visual to kind of draw things to a conclusion. We didn't dwell on the sense, but it's there, but we dwelt on the incarnation. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus spoke a very interesting little one-line parable. Here it is. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it, all, till it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. The kingdom of heaven has a life of its own. What happens if you just mix the yeast and do nothing with it? Nothing. Actually, it goes out of date. It goes out of date. And I say this carefully, but sometimes as the church, when we've withdrawn from the world, all that's happened is we've got out of date. Because you see, yeast on its own just bubbles away. But then Jesus says, this woman took it and mixed it into a large amount of flour till it worked through all the dough. Where's your mixing happening? Where are your communities that you're part of? Because you see, in you, you've got the yeast of the kingdom of God. Are you mixing it? Are you mixing it in your communities? It's not about you, it's about him in you being expressed. Are you present? Is there that frequency and regularity that allows that Christ-likeness to be seen? Have you got time for spontaneity? And given time, the yeast begins to work. I think that one's about to blow, actually. But uh, it begins to work. And then something very interesting happens, and I'm going to, Lord forgive me, but I think it is in the parable. I know it doesn't go as far as dough, but, uh, sorry, it doesn't go as far as bread, it gets as far as dough, but can you see that what happens is when you bring the yeast and it's mixed into the flour, actually what you get is dough. 
you get something else. And as the kingdom of God is mixed into local communities, something completely new emerges. Actually, what emerges are disciples and then the church. And that's what happened in the very early church. And do you remember when we looked at the spread into Judea and Samaria? And some wicked Christians told some Gentiles about Jesus. <gasps> and they mixed the yeast of the kingdom with some new dough, and something brand new emerged. Something that had never been seen before, a church with Gentiles. <gasps> Terrible thing. Something new emerged. And as we mix the kingdom of God, the yeast of the kingdom, who knows what God will grow? And I think the challenge for us this morning is, let's humbly take Jesus at his word. And let's say, Jesus, Lord Jesus, this is the parable that you've spoken. A woman took and mixed the yeast into a large amount of flour till it worked through all the dough. Lord Jesus, we're going to do that, and we're going to see what you will bring about. I picked a closing song, and I can't remember what it was. So. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so it's a song that uh, takes up really the wonder of who Jesus is, the way in which it's expressed in this passage. Jesus, God's righteousness revealed. But then it goes on to speak about the kingdom and the coming king. Let's stand together, shall we, and celebrate this together.
do invite you to uh, join us for coffee afterwards through the, uh, the door there. One of the cell groups has gone out to get that ready for us, so don't let's disappoint them. But before we do that, let's give the Holy Spirit just an opportunity in our lives to reflect on what I've been saying. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence among us. And if there is anything specific that you want to say into our individual lives now, we ask that you will do that. And so, just invite you to think of one of the communities that you're part of at the moment. Maybe you're not even aware of that, and the Holy Spirit will bring that to mind. Actually, this is a community. Or maybe he will say, this is the key community for you at this time. And as you think about that community, as you just hold it before God, the Holy Spirit is present in that community with you. Now maybe just as you hold it before him, he's going to give you some revelation. He's going to show you a key person, or a key situation, or a key place. Somewhere that he wants you to be, someone who he wants you to be with, something to pray into. So let's just keep a moment's quiet as we allow the Holy Spirit time to speak into our lives. 